it was actually quite surprising that so many people hadn't planned um, what they were going to do with their bonded um, return of service. Um, but you say that now with extra data, that's got some nuances. Um, but it, they divide into two groups, do they? Well, yeah, because what we found is that, broadly speaking, mm, junior doctors were divided into those who had um, demonstrated a lot more planning capacity. And so there were the ones that we were calling the, the planners, as opposed to the explorers, which are just um, trying different things out and see how they go. And what I was saying is that I think that the new data that we have uh, will confirm that even those who are the, the planners, if you want, um, didn't really have uh, many plans in place as far as the bonded medical placement uh, requirements are concerned. So there's little evidence of planning um, around the, the, the requirements of the bonded medical place. Okay, oh, that's interesting because we were really feeling surprised. I mean, I was surprised given that they had known throughout their medical program that they were had a return of service obligation. Yeah. How few of them had actually taken that into effect, yeah. uh, into account, especially because in their junior years, they were supposed to have done a return if they could. Um, and a lot of yeah. them, the requirement was once they had finished specialising, was held yeah. off. Yeah, and some and some of them um, did show that they had made you know the best out of the plan and had gone towards meeting the requirements of of the uh, the bonded places. But uh, um, they seem to almost fall into two extreme categories, as far as I, I I can see from from the data that we have. Yeah, I remember one of them um, had nearly finished their bonded requirements before they got to, to specialty training. Mm -hmm. um, and they were pretty happy about that because clearly once you get into special training you don't yeah. know where you're going to end up yeah um, and yeah. this was definitely i think i think i remember the one you were talking about and this is definitely someone who had demonstrated throughout the interview and with regards to uh, their career in general a high degree of of planning um compared with um, with other junior doctors um i I, th I can think of one also who had managed to integrate that into their career um, as well as their partner's career and the requirements for their, their partners as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it takes health, uh, health services in terms of jobs, I guess, you know, in the previous, the, the era in which this bonding stuff was created, there were, the market for employment was wide open. But I think, um, I don't know how you feel from the data, but it is not, it's not so wide open now. And I think they do have to make decisions based on what they can get. That's right. And I think that a lot of uh, decision making is, is made on the go as they go. And so another thing that we wanted to, to explore with um, more interviews is how that time element plays out in terms of decision making and how um, decision making processes change over time. So towards the beginning of their um, pre-vocational training. Um, as they as they sort of transition through it and they get to a vocational training period, um, and I think that for for some of them, I was surprised myself that um, some of our participants demonstrated very little understanding of what the requirements would be for them in terms of um, meeting those um, you know those requirements that they are, they had signed up for, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know, I remember when I was reading the interviews, being surprised to find that there were a few who had already clearly decided that they didn't want to do the return and that they were going to pay the system out, which That's is fair right. enough, because that is actually mentioned when they, when they accept the bond. How's that panned out with the new data that you've collected? Is that still... Well, we would, need to, we would need to look into it in more detail, so I can't, I wouldn't want to venture, you know, um, an opinion on that before having a look at the data specifically looking at, um, at that, that topic. Yeah, uh, but I mean it was it was like I had thought in Australia that that didn't happen um, because Australians usually are pretty as we're finding out with this pandemic usually we, we you know if we agree to something we do it. Um, mm -hmm. In America it's really common um, the literature that I've looked at so far has shown that because so many me medical school is so expensive in America and a lot of students take bonding into the armed services and so on. It, 
yeah. yeah it, it is it is an interesting space because i i do remember also that there were a couple of our participants who seemed to resent the program somehow and yeah. these were those who were planning to practice rule anyway and who had very strong rule intention mm -hmm. and who somehow resented the fact that they were bonded because they were already planning to do that kind of work anyway. And so it's really interesting how um, people are actually reacting to having that, um, that contract that they sign and how they, they feel about it. But I get the impression nonetheless that for the majority, I think because of the busyness of the first, the early years of their, tra their training, they seem to be caught up in the the busyness of it all and just um, you know taking one day at a time pretty much mm -hmm. it's interesting i think um that one of the things that the bonded program doesn't do that rcs does which is to give them a community of practice as they're going through so you know we know that rcs has really good work outcomes in terms of people yeah. eventually working rural but the bonding programs don't seem to I, I mean i don't know i guess it depends on the university and obviously we were restricted yeah. to the people who are working in the west australian context with rural yeah. with wax um, but they didn't seem to be aware of others who were in the yeah. same position as them would you agree I agree. I do. I do remember one who mentioned, and this was um, somebody who didn't appear to have a strong intention to to yeah. practice rurally, and so um, they were saying that they had heard of others who had paid, um, you know, paid back if you want to the program instead of going ahead and doing their their rural um, their rural practice. So. But I agree in the sense that they, they, they didn't, they, it didn't come up in the conversation that they had those conversations with others where they would have been able to share their experiences and their approaches to meeting those commitments. Yeah. It to be something that they approached very individually. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that's one of the areas, obviously we were interviewing people coming from a hub perspective in terms of new funding to allow hubs into the postgraduate training space. Um, and my feeling is that it's actually going to be really important because the hubs are a collegial RCS-like organisation that aims to bring people together who have a passion for to enable that to happen. So um, my feeling is that that is actually going to be that, that kind of social networking aspect of hubs is probably going to be really beneficial yeah. um, because the health services don't know, don't they, when, when students take uh, terms, they don't say whether they're bonded or not. So the health services don't yeah. know whether That's they right. are. So, yeah. That's um, that definitely, I, I agree with that 100%. I also think, you know, those who, are not rurally committed and who have uh, more of an urban intention because we know from the data that in some cases, in fact, quite often, um, just having an experience in, in rural and regional areas uh, seems to be, you know, this, this process of conversion that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And so both personal conversion and professional conversion as well. So I think it will be really interesting to find a way to, um, to identify somehow um, those who haven't put their hand up and who perhaps have approached the hubs because it's not necessarily their primary intention to practice rurally however they might be open to having those experiences that might be so transformative that then they sort of convert um, yeah. to, to rural and, and definitely we know from the data that we have the the ongoing you know with the ongoing um, research that we are doing that um, in some cases just those particularly when they are early um, in their career development that that those experiences can be transformative um, so those rural um, experiences both at a professional level and at a personal level can be really transformative and so those who initially had trained um, didn't come from a rural background had no particular intention of working rurally 
um, have literally switched their intention following, um, say, for example, following internships in, in regional areas or following um, experiences uh, during the initial early years of um, revocational training. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we're working on other data that shows that intention is very mutable in mm. medical students and that even having rural background doesn't necessarily mean that you are fixed in your rural intention for mm. your, your future uh, career. Yeah. Um, and so all these exp experiences are really important. And so we, yeah. we're not decrying the importance of bonding, but just saying that we do need to be a little bit more intentional with the students and graduates around how they conceive of their practice and that they can see it as a real career advancer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think that the, the rural career path has changed over time. Um, and there is a lot more interest in specialty training in rural areas. Yeah, um, and it's having a real up upturn. So this hopefully will capture the hub space as well and it'll be a synergistic. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't think there were any other things that I was thinking about with respect to the bonded data, um, except to say that there's lots of room for things to change and to improve. Yes. Um, yeah, I know that we've, Ian Putty and I have shown some statistical effects of bonding so that it does have, a, you know, a, a pull people back to a rural experience. And I think it's spot on right, Beatrice, that um, when you have a good rural experience, it can be totally transformative because we know from the RCS MCs just by, the, you know, before RCS has existed, before um, bonding existed, before any of that stuff, we've got a number of staff with RCS who our urban background, urban trained, and who've ended up rural, and they're passionate about rural. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the opposite is true as well. And I think that that demonstrates also that with time, um, decision making changes because the factors uh, that surround you sort of change as well. And life happens, and partners um, happen, and yeah. relationships, and and so um, there's a bit of both um, happening in both directions as well, which we. Yeah to be mindful of because it's not because you you have a very strong intention at the beginning that that's going to um, translate into into future um, career um, in, in, in the regional uh, and rural areas. 